Second Peter chapter 2. I've titled this False Teachers Part 1. We'll get Part 2 next week and see if there's a Part 3. I don't know, there may be or not. But we're going to look at, I guess, counterfeits. And counterfeits are nothing new. Uh, Satan has been called the great imitator, and he's been hard at work ever since he deceived Eve in the garden. Um, Satan has a false gospel. Satan has a false righteousness. Satan has implanted false Christians throughout the last 2,000 years in the church. And very, very, very soon now, Satan will present to an unsuspecting world a false Christ. And he's on his way. And we're to be prepared and ready for that. And what Peter's doing here in 2 Peter chapter 2 is he's warning his readers that false teachers will be arriving soon and trying to manipulate the church. He's telling them to be ready because they're on their way. Now the false teachers at the time Peter's writing this have not arrived yet. And he's telling them this is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They're coming and when they come, they're going to come and they're going to do one thing. They're going to try to manipulate you to get your eyes off of Jesus Christ, to get your eyes off of the word of God and to put your eyes on anything else that will make you compromise, thinking that you're doing the right thing. They're coming to lie. They're coming to deceive. They're coming to manipulate. That's what he's showing them here. And it really is the, the Holy Spirit that's showing that. So he's saying these false teachers have not come yet, but they are coming. And when they come, they're going to come in groves. And Peter's saying, I want you to be ready for them. Now, the day and age we live in today, there's 99.9% .9 false teachers out there today. On the internet, on the web, you, you name it, in churches a, a grow all across the world. There are false teachers. There's false religions. There's false righteousness. There's false believers. And, and hopefully you leave here today and you understand deep in the core of your being that you are a follower of Jesus Christ according to the word of God. And that you're not manipulated by it or, or allowing somebody, maybe you love somebody on the radio or the internet that you love to listen to. And maybe you think they're really a great teacher, uh, this person, whoever they are. And you may be fully duped by them. And you may be one who thinks, I can't be duped. And you certainly may be. And, and Peter is warning for that. Now listen, a false prophet and a false teacher, that's what he's going to talk about. Now, a false prophet is from the Old Testament. A false prophet is one who makes up what he believes God will say and tries to direct the people that way. A false prophet is there. They stood with Jeremiah. They stood with Isaiah. They stood with Hosea. All the minor prophets, they stood with them and they proclaimed, thus says the Lord. And they spoke. And they were false prophets. They said what they wanted the people to hear. That's a false prophet. Peter's saying here in verse 1, he says, Fal false prophets also arose among the people, that's the Old Testament, just as there will be false teachers among you, he's saying in these false teachers. Now a false teacher is one who takes what God has already recorded and twists it to fit his own agenda. So a false prophet, they don't, they don't, even touch the word of God. They just say, thus says the Lord, and they speak. And, and they want you to believe they're speaking from God. And a false teacher, a false teacher takes the word of God and twists it to fit his liking. Twists it to fit what he wants you to hear, not what God wants you to hear. And that's the difference between the two. So be very careful as you venture on in your Christian life who you listen to. You have the word of God and you can read it in context and not be stumbled by it. You can listen to false teachers all day and be stumbled by them because they're out of context in the word of God. 
The nation of Israel had its share of false prophets. They were constantly leading the nation astray. And again, a false prophet will, will generally always tell the people what they want to hear. The church today has false teachers who lead believers astray by taking the word of God and making it say what they want you to hear. And they're out there all over the place. And it's all the work of Satan the great counterfeiter, he's the great imitator of God's promises. God does a miracle, Satan tries to, to back up, to, 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 to imitate that miracle, to fool people and to get them away from what God is doing. Let's read verses 1 through 3. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be also false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow this sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words, and their judgment from long ago was not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. So Peter gives a description here of these false teachers that are on their way. And, and, and again, it's the Holy Spirit showing the church throughout the generations, because God knew Second Peter would be recorded in the canon of Scripture. And he knew for the last 2,000 years, the church would need a solid word of God to not be misled by. So he inspired Peter to pen this so that the generations of God's grace would be given out to his people um, so that they could see just what these false teachers will be like so you know how to turn away from them and not, and not follow them. You know, you take the, the epistle of Jude and you read it, you find Jude describes these false teachers in almost the same way that Peter does. So God is showing his church to beware of these false doctrines and these false agendas of false teachers. What Peter's going to do in these first three verses is show the agenda of these false teachers uh, we're gonna, there's three of them, three agendas here, four agendas. The first one's going to be deception. So this will be the outline. Number one, deception. Number two is going to be denial. They're going to deny Christ. Number three is going to be impurity. They're, all, they're based off their own lust. That's what they're all about. And number four is greed. So there's four agendas of these false teachers, deception, denial, impurity, and greed. In verse one, he says, these false prophets also arose among the people just as there will be false teachers among you. So the so first thing they do is use deception. Peter says here, they're among you, which means they will find a home among you. Why? Because a false teacher, according to the word of God, is not able to lead the world in a counterfeit way. The world doesn't care about Christ. You do. The church does. So a false teacher will never find his home in the world. He'll always find his home among you, among God's people. It's where he can hide his own agenda. And that's what he shows there. Because the world sees through their front, but the church, on the other hand, in its, in its innocence in Christ, is learning to surrender over to the Lord every day. So what happens is a false teacher comes in. We're learning to surrender to Christ according to the word of God. And a false teacher comes in, has his own agenda. First thing he does is deceive you by pretending to be one of the sheep or a great leader. And he comes in and he twists the word of God because you're already surrendered in your heart. That's why he can't affect the world, but he can affect the church. So, so he gets you to follow his own agenda for his own personal gain by manipulating the word of God. So what Peter's showing here is they, they will come in among you without proper authority. It means they haven't been sent by God to teach you his word. They came in of their own agenda. So they'll, they'll teach you towards spiritual ruin. 
They'll proclaim that which God never gave them to proclaim, and they'll contradict the very grace given to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's how they use deception. So this theme of deception runs straight through the entire chapter because a false teacher is all about deception. So right away, Peter shows that these false teachers' messages are false. They're not true. They're nothing we should be listening to. And just as there were counterfeit prophecies in ancient times, there's going to be counterfeit teachers among us. And he says here uh, that, that they introduce um, destructive heresies. And the implication here of a destructive heresy means making a choice. In, in the Greek and the Hebrew, it, it literally means having a party spirit. Now, a party spirit, it's promoting a party spirit in the church. That's one of the works of the flesh. So whenever a believer in some fellowship walks up to another believer and says, listen, are you on my side or the pastor's side? They've just used a party spirit, caused division in the church. If the pastor has been called by God to teach his word, what's the responsibility of the congregation? To hear that word, to listen to that word, and to do what that word says. In it lies all you need to walk with Christ. All you need to become a godly man and woman in the word of God that's been brought to you by someone called of God to teach it to you. But a false teacher comes in and he manipulates that in, in, a, in a way and, and forces you to make a choice. Do you believe what this one saying, or do you believe me, causing a division inside the church? And that's how divisions happen all the time. So a false teacher forces you to make a choice between his doctrines and the doctrines of the true Christian faith, and, and, and they will use the twisting of God's word to do it. So not only is their message false, but the method they use is false. So instead of openly declaring what they believe, they come into the church under false colors, and they give the impression that they are of the true Christian faith, and they are not. Do you ever meet somebody who says, I love the Lord and I'm a follower of Christ? And then, and then some, one thing goes wrong and, and all of a sudden, where's the love of God in the heart? Why do you have to explode all the time? Why do you got to throw things? Why do you got to be bitter? Why do you got to be angry? Nowhere in scriptures is saying, I was led by the Holy Spirit to be bitter. I was led by the Holy Spirit to be angry. Jesus flipped a table, so I have the right to flip tables. No, that's, that's a false word. That's out of context. And there's something very strong in here. I think in today's day and age, there are so many false teachers out there that we get caught up. It's easy to get caught up in them. I think, I believe with all my heart, if God's given you a fellowship to be a part of, why do you seek instruction elsewhere? You have the word of God that teaches you the truth. You have the word of God being taught within the fellowship throughout the whole week. Come and hear the Lord. Come and hear what he's got to say because he has the answer that you need. And, and Peter's showing that there. Um, you know, it says they secretly introduce these destructive heresies. So they, they don't throw out their truth immediately, it means they simply come alongside the truth to as to give the impression that they believe all the fundamentals of the faith that we believe. They come, they come in right alongside. Here I am, ah, look at me, and yet they have a truth that's hidden and buried somewhere. And the truth is their own agenda. They don't, you know... Uh, Peter says in verse 3 that they're going to use false words. And that's frightening because the Greek term in the word false words is, is the word plastos. It's where we get our word plastic. It means, it means moldable to fit anything you want it to fit. I'm going to, I'm going to get some plastic. You want a cup? Make a mold of a cup. Psh, now you got a cup. Take the same plastic. Melt it down. You want a fork? Make a mold of a fork. Now you get a fork. I need a dashboard. Make a mold of a dashboard. Same plastic. Melt it down. Make it into a dashboard. Sorry, the word of God doesn't work that way. 
The word of God is given to us in context by God. And no human being has the right, as Peter showed last week, has the right to manipulate that word to make it fit what he wants it to fit. We have a solid truth in front of us. It's a solid word. And false teachers will not adhere to that in any way, shape, or form. They want, the, they want the word of God to be molded into whatever they want it to be molded into. They will take words like salvation or inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They're going to take great words of the Christian faith and they're going to use them, but they're not going to mean what the word of God means. There's religions out there that have the same wording we have. Holy Spirit, blood of Christ, salvation, justification, righteousness. But those words in their context are out of context with what God's word says. And that's how they snag you and draw you in. And then you get in there and you find this is what you're really all about. That's false so what happens is immature and untaught believers hear these false words and then they'll buy their books and they'll think that these men and women are of sound faith, but they're not. You got to remember this. Satan's a liar, so his ministers are liars. Satan's a deceiver, so his ministers are deceiver. They use the word of God not to enlighten God's people, but to entertain them and deceive them. That's what Peter starts off with. Very, very important. And then again in verse 1. They're gonna, they deny the, the deity of Christ and his true humanity. It says here, um, but false prophets also rose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. Introduce, uh, they will secretly introduce destructive heresies. He says here, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. So, so they, they deny the very God who saved their soul. Let me ask you this. Do we serve a triune God or a, or, or a one single God? We serve a triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Word of God teaches it. It's undeniable that we serve a triune God. So you say, I don't believe in God, but I trust the Holy Spirit. You're a liar. Because God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are God Almighty. And if, and if some religion teaches that's wrong, that's out of order, they're false teachers. And you should stay far away from them. Because they're leading their people into, into, into hell, really. And false teachers are better known for what they deny than for what they affirm. They deny the inspiration of the word of God. They deny the sinfulness of man. They deny the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross. They deny salvation by faith alone. They deny the reality of eternal judgment. And specifically, false teachers especially deny the deity of Jesus Christ because they know if they can do away with his deity, they can destroy the entire body of Christianity. The word of God teaches us. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born. Who do we celebrate every Christmas? What child was born? What's his name? Jesus Christ. We celebrate it every Christmas. Unto us a child was born. Unto us a son is given. He was a male given over by the, by, the, by the Holy Spirit to marry, to raise, to be the Savior of the world. It says, and the government shall be on his shoulders and his name shall be called. That means his authority in his character, his personal being, shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. This is God who became flesh and, and impregnated Mary with himself. And she birthed a man who was God-man, Jesus Christ. Who came down to this earth to save us from our, a sin that we could never pay the debt of. Only he could do it. 
In Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through 3, God says, But now so says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame kindle on you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. God proclaims in his word, he is the only God of all creation. He is the only God and Savior of all mankind. Undeniable. Then in Isaiah 45, he says, I am the Lord and there is none else no God beside me. I clothed you, though you have not known me. I am the Lord, and there is none else, forming the light and creating darkness, making peace and creating evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. I have made the earth and created man on it. I, with my hands, have stretched out the heavens, and all their hosts have I commanded. Is it not I, the Lord, and there is no other God beside me? a just God and Savior. There is none besides me. So turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. You can't deny that. And you can say, go become a Jew and learn Hebrew all you want. It won't change the scriptures. It doesn't change the truth of God's word. In Philippians chapter 2, it says, For let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found fashioned as a man means he fashioned himself as a man in the womb of Mary. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. God Almighty, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. God Almighty became flesh and walked on this earth, was born a young boy, grew up and to be a man so that he could carry the weight of our sin and our shame and put it to death on the cross that we might be freed from ourselves and our sin to love and serve him and to be with him for all of eternity. And you know what? Christianity is Christ. If he is not what he claims to be, Emmanuel, God with us, God among us, then there could be no Christian faith. No human being as godly as he could ever be could go to the cross and die for the sins of the world. None. Only God could do that. So only God could wash away our sin and pay our debt. Only God could have given his pure, innocent, guiltless life to ransom us back to himself. That's an amazing thing. We have the truth and the reality of the truth of God's word. And we go out there, there are false teachers out there that take the word of God and twist it. You've got professors in colleges and high schools and, and grammar schools teaching evolution that millions of years ago. And we have a young generation of lost kids because they have no comprehension of God whatsoever. And yet you and I hold the truth of this word. Ask your own heart this. Do you really believe it? Do you really believe this word holds all the answers to your problems? This word holds all the strength you need to get through every day. This word holds all the healing you'll ever need. This word holds the absolute truth of sin and God's judgment of sin and God's way to make a, a, a way for us to be his Penalty, the death, he paid the debt for us. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And he offers himself to you and I. He offers, he offers himself to you right here, right now. None of us, no, no person in this room is guaranteed your next heartbeat. 
Are you sure you want to face God with what you believe of him and his word right now? If Christ is not the Lord of your heart, if you don't believe this word is his word, are you really ready to face eternity? Or maybe right now you've got to say, Lord, I've got to get my heart right. I need to trust you at your word. You're the savior of the world. You're the God of my life, the savior of my soul. And I want to make that right right now because I don't, have, I don't have another chance. I may not have another chance. God gives it to you. You make it in your heart right now before him. But see, false teachers don't go down that path. They take a whole different road. They draw you to themselves. Then in verse 2, he says, you know, through immorality, they, they falsely lead others. Many will follow this sensuality. And because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. So they're going to be characterized by immorality and greed, okay? Implying a few things, that they will use the grace of God to give full permission to sin. And many will follow their evil teaching that there's nothing wrong with sexual sin here because of this, the, the way of Christ and his way is going to be scoffed at. When he talks about will fall this sensuality, the sensuality here is strong. It implies that all they want is to satisfy their own lust and they do it under the guise of religion. Why? Because they can't hide out there in the world. But they can put on the cloak of Christianity and step right into the church and play a Christian game. Does everybody understand the Christian game? You're a Sunday saint and a Monday ain't. <laughs> You're like, here, Lord, I love you while I'm with everybody. Then I go back home, man. I just go walk my own path, and God's going, knock it off. You're most miserable deep inside because you do it yourself. Walk with me. Just like you walk with my people. Or maybe, <laughs> maybe you walk bitter towards God's people. God's like, don't walk with me that way. Go love my people. And you know what? You'll learn to love me. More than you think you do. Go be a part of their lives. Go walk out this grace that I've given you. So, so the fact that many would follow their evil example shows there's going to be many who would rather follow what is false than that which is true. They'd rather follow the sensual rather than the spiritual. And these false teachers, they're going to be very successful. That's what Peter's showing here. Oh, they're going to have many following. They're going to have glowing statistics to report. They're going to have crowds that are gathered to hear them. But you know what? The broad statistics are no proof of Christ inside someone's heart. Because these false teachers, they're going to claim to be true servants of Christ, but will be rejected in the end on that day when they stand before God. You can only put on a front for so long. If the love of God is leading you, you can go all day and all night without, without rest, and you can just do it. But when you're living by a front, when you're living in a counterfeit, they can't go. And that's what these false teachers are really all about. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, he said, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. And many will say to me on that day, that last day, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And in your name have we not cast out devils? And in your name have we not done many wonderful works? And I will then profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, from you who work iniquity. And the frightening thing is, it just as, as natural human beings, our desire and our long is always for something tangible, something we can grab hold of, something to hold on to. That's why drug addicts get lost in drugs, because they got something to hold on to in that. And then you go to church, you're like, well, I'm trying to hear the pastor, but I got nothing to hold on to. You have the same word I got. You have the same faith I walk in. It's no different than anybody in this room. I choose to surrender to Christ, to his leading and his word. 
And therein lies all the strength I need. And, and if, I, if I drift off that path, God assures me in such a way, he lets me go in my own strength for a time until I crash. And then I back right back up and surrender to him and follow him and trust him again, right? So he shows that. But these, these false teachers, many will follow their principles and practices and then through their own impurity, they begin to malign and criticize and slander all who are among the church. And what does it do? It gives the world around a clear view that the love of God is not in your midst. False teachers teach in such a way it causes division in the body of Christ because a false teacher will use anger, pride, and bitterness between brethren. I had a lady that I know was a solid Christian, so I thought loved the Lord, believed in the Lord, was part of our fellowship for a long time. Then met this guy who I know is a false teacher. And I said, be careful, you know. Oh, no, you don't understand. When I stand close to him, I can feel God. Like red flag. It's not how it works. That's called charismania. Watch out for that. And then the next thing I know, she comes in, I have these scriptures that he gave me, God gave me. God gave you? No, this man gave me through God. And the scriptures, what do they? They condemned our fellowship, and they condemned me. And it says, I, I, God called me away from you people. Hold on. That's out of context. Well, I don't want to talk scripture. You can not talk scripture all day, but you're throwing it at me. You're being led by a false teacher. Be careful. She's away. She's not even in fellowship anymore. I see her sometimes. Come on back. Come back in where you belong. I can't go there. Why? I just can't. Yes, you can. Pick up your Bible. Get back into fellowship where you belong. What will people think? No one's going to care. They're going to be glad to see you. Everybody knows. Everybody here understand how easy it is to stumble down the wrong road? Anybody here ever stumble down the wrong road? Oh, look, I'm not alone, right? Were you thankful? Were you thankful to God for a brother or sister who helped you get back on the path? Get back on where you belong. Yeah, but my heart's not fully right. No one's heart's fully right. That's why Christ lives there. Get back in where you belong and walk with God's people. Put aside the, the, the world, the flesh, and the devil. You know, but, but false, false teachers don't do that. They come to cause division. A Christian faith gets a bad name because of the lives of false teachers and what they do to the body of Christ. They cause division. They get people to be angry at each other and bitter towards one another. Shut that down. Put it aside. Aren't we to take all our anxieties and place them on him? Here you go, Lord. Here's my bitter heart. Here's my anger. Here's my pride. Here's my rage. I know it for what it is. It is. I give it to you again. Anybody here ever get sick or tired of giving it to the Lord a million times? <laughs> Keep doing it. That's why he's there. He knows you. He knows me. He knows what we're all about. He knows you love him, he knows you trust him, and he knows you're still human. And he's saying, here I am, I'm your strong tower, run to me. Here I am, I'm the high place, run up to me, I'll hold you, I'll keep you. Lord, I can't carry this weight anymore, come up alongside me, my yoke is easy, my burden's light, come to me. It's always going to be come to me, to Christ. And that's where the scripture should always point in that way. In Titus chapter 1, verse 16, he talks about these false teachers. They profess to know God, but in their works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient unto every good work reprobate. That means any good thing they try to do just turns sour. And then in verse 3, through greed they're going to try to exploit you. He says, in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle. And their destruction is not asleep. So in their desire to want more, that's through greed, they will peddle you. Think about it that way. They will make merchandise out of you. 
They will exploit you. They will take advantage of you with great sounding words which are full of emptiness and false hope. I think we were watching the internet, I don't know how many years back, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, and there was this false teacher that was on there, and he was like, and the Lord said I need to buy a brand new airplane. I only need $170,000. And God says, tell the people to do that, because I need to go from point A to point B in style. You're like, wait a minute, he already got three airplanes. The Lord said another one. Yeah, he did. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. He got his airplane. That's pretty sad. I think I told you. <laughs> my wife, when she worked at the post office, to get all this mail in. One of them went to a lady that didn't exist. It was some name. It was uh, Pat Myers. And uh, there was some false teacher. And he's like, Pat, he opened up the, I opened up the mail. Looked at, it was, you put your foot on the footprint. And then you tape a nickel to the paper. And then you mail it in, and he's going to bless all the footprints. And all oh, prosperity will happen to you, and that nickel will turn to 5,000. And on and on and on and on and on it went. And then, and then, then another letter came back, and my wife's like, it's for Pat. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. So I, I opened it up. I looked at it. Another one, I'll put your handprint on there. And it'll look doubly blessed. I know you're already blessed by that footprint. So put your handprint on there and put a nickel on there and send it back. And I wrote this big, long letter. I don't know if I got in trouble or not. I said, first of all, sir, you got my name wrong. It's not Pat Myas. It's Pat My. <laughs> Made it really clear, baby. Call me back sometime. Don't ever send me a letter again. And I mailed it off. And Kelly's like, I can't believe you mailed that letter. I'm like, he needs to hear it. Or I got a phone call one day. I think I told you about that one. The, 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 my wife bought a book from some ministry online. And all of a sudden, I get this phone call. They're like, Mr. Maletto. I'm like, Maletto? I'm like, yes. Oh, so-and-so knows you bought this book and has been praying for you to be blessed. And on and on. And Mr. Maletto and Mr. Maletto, the Holy Spirit has pressed this man to bless you. Wants to know if you can send a summer gift. I go, first of all, you're a liar. It was dead silent. I said, if the Holy Spirit told you to call me, he'd get my name right. <laughs> hey, Maletto, it's Malette. <laughs> Have a great day and go call somebody else or just get off the line. But, but what they do is that what they do, they do for greed. Somebody's... Uh, televangelists that are on TV, they make millions and millions of dollars. And unfortunately, a lot of it comes from the elderly. Because they're in their own home, they're in their own place, and they're just alone. And you flip the TV on, and there's some, looks like hope. And just send this gift, and we'll pray for you and be blessed. And that's all they want is to know somebody cares, that's all. So you send your money in, and that's one person, out, and then two million people do it. And you know what? You make a lot of money doing that. And it's a real shame. So, you know, the, these teachers in their greed will tell you anything they can to get a hold of your money. And yet, what's he say here? God knows their judgment and their destruction is on its way. It will not fall short. God will judge every false teacher out there. I know that as a pastor, I will give an account to God for the word I teach. I'm going to give an account for what I taught you of his word. And it had better be his word. Because my word or my opinion can't help your life in any way, shape or form. And if I manipulate this word, it cannot help you in any way, shape or form. But if I just give you his word, place it out there for you to take as the Lord shows you to take it, it can change and radically transform your life and give you a living hope deep down in the core of your being. He says these teachers, they'll exploit you, means to make merchandise out of you. It speaks of a cloak of covetousness. Think about it. They cover themselves with a coveting heart. 
So they don't look at you as God's people. They look at you. Who's got the most money? I'm looking out here. Who's the best dressed? Bang. Yeah, it's a, they got the money. And I told them, oh, I want to give to the Ron Millette Fund. Really, he needs it really bad. Or whatever the case is, they have something to say, and they, and they pick you out for that. If you think about it, while Jesus was here in this earth, he was a very poor man. And his apostles didn't go out rich, I can tell you that. They were very poor men, yet they gave of themselves to minister to others. That's what they did. It was the rich political priests of Jesus' time. They were the ones laundering the money uh, for their own gain. So these false teachers will do the same thing. They're rich, and they get their riches by exploiting others. In fact, we just finished Micah chapter 3 on Wednesday night, and Micah was describing these false prophets of his day and what God was, the judgment God was going to give them. That was a heavy judgment, Micah chapter 3. Read that sometime. He says this, her leaders pronounce judgment for a bribe. That means all your judges in your courtrooms are only judging for a bribe. You take a man here, he's absolutely guilty and this person's innocent, yet the guilty man has enough money, pays off the judge, innocent, walk away. That's what he's saying there. Then he says, her priests instruct for a price. That means your priests, those who are teaching the word of God, they're only teaching the word of God for money. I'd like to teach on Sunday, but how much am I going to get? I'd like to really teach the word, but what am I going to make out of this? And then he says, and, and, and her prophets divine for money. And the prophets, that would be the politicians, the theologians, the men who were overseeing the leading of the nation. They only do it for money. We lead the nation by what I can get out of it. You know, so these false teachers uh, that Peter's talking about here, they're going to have in the center of their hearts immorality and the love of money and pride. They're going to use plastic words as well as great swelling words to fascinate and influence their victims. They will flatter sinners and tell them the kind of ego-building words that they want to hear. They're going to scratch the itching ears of people who reject the truth of God's word by turning it into fables. And they'll find that religion can be a tremendous tool for exploiting the weak. And these false teachers will use it to get whatever they can. So you know what a false teacher is? False teacher is not a minister. He's a merchandiser. He's not out to see what God's people need. He's, he's out to get what he wants out of it. And that's what we beware of. And that happens a lot. Just happened recently down in Brattleboro. That's false teaching right? that goes on. A true minister of Jesus Christ has nothing to hide in his life. A true minister of Jesus Christ, he has no agenda whatsoever. He's there to do what God wants. Period. And his life and his ministry is an open book. A true minister of Jesus Christ will preach the truth of God's word in love and won't twist the scriptures to support his own selfish ideas. A true minister of Jesus Christ is not there to flatter the rich or to minister only to make money. He's there to serve his Lord, and he knows that serving his Lord means serving God's people. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, But we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. We have put aside all that was false in our life to walk according to the, our conscience, according to the word of God. To what? To bring you the truth. That's why Jude and Peter and John and Paul and Matthew and Luke and Mark can all write in a completely different way. Yet they all say the same thing. Everything points to Jesus Christ as Lord, to the security of our hearts in the word of God, and to hold fast to that, and to be in fellowship, and to grow in Christ in that nature as, as God shows us. 
That's why in the last book of First Peter we looked at in chapter 5, verse 1, he said, I exhort the elders who are among you, I being also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. He says, feed the flock of God among you, taking the oversight, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for sordid gain, but readily, nor is lording it over those allotted to you by God, but becoming examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a never fading crown of glory. That's the call of a teacher, of pastor, a minister. But the false teachers, they're out there in groves. So what's Peter doing in these first three verses? He writes to the church to show them the agenda of these false teachers. Watch out, he's saying. They come to deceive the church, to deny Christ, to plant impurity, their own impurity, and to come with hearts of greed. And he's warning them to be alert because these false teachers were on the way. And he's encouraging them also to refuse to support any ministries that exploit people and deny the deity of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So he shows that. That's a very important foundation that we need as we go to look into these false teachers. We've looked at their agenda. In the next few weeks, we're going to kind of pick them apart and look at what they're really all about. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time you've given us to spend in your word. And I pray, Lord, that your word would be driven home in every heart by your Holy Spirit. That the truth of your word would illuminate Christ as Lord and Savior of every soul. Lord, soften hearts to all that you have. Water your word in our hearts. Let it grow and take root so it cannot be taken away by the enemy. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.